Welcome to Building with Brick, foundational wisdom on coaching, careers, and Christ. This leadership podcast was spawned by Coach Brickner's book, So You Want to Be a Coach, which is the story of a corporate executive who made a drastic career change and became a head men's basketball coach. Dr. Brickner's book is available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook on Amazon.com or go to his website, www.drjoebrickner.com. That's D R J O E Brickner.com. Now, here's this week's podcast. Welcome back, folks. My guest, Mike Tharp, former teammate of mine, international journalist, um, just a, a great mentor for me in the past, and actually edited my book that I wrote, So You Want to Be a Coach. So I have a lot, uh, I owe a lot. This this man is a wonderful <laughs> person, and uh, I'm proud to be able to call him a friend. Mike, before the break, we talked about uh, some of the things that went on with your, your high school career, how you got the Benedicts and everything. Um, but the one thing that most of the people that I talk to talk about is they had someone who influenced them, and almost always it's been a coach. Now, we've been talking most of the time with people in the athletic field, but were there coaches involved in your life or were there others involved in your life that really influenced you uh, to pursue excellence? And in your case, it was excellence in journalism. The three coaches who influenced me the most were Ken Dutel, our head coach in high school, and then the two assistants at St. Benedict's, Bill Samuels, my freshman and sophomore year, and junior and senior year, Tom Caldwell. They all taught me different and separate things. But whatever they taught me really resonated with me, not only at the time, but until now. Uh, Coach Butel had a mantra almost of saying, the easiest thing in the world to do is to make an excuse. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. I, I used that a lot when I was teaching journalism and uh, also uh, when I was a volunteer assistant coach in high school in San Pedro, L.A. Uh, Bill Samuels taught me the technical aspects of the game that nobody else had ever about hmm. taken the time to teach me. The main one being that he taught me to pop my wrist when I was shooting before that I was just kind of like this mm -hmm. and he said to make it like a snake is striking and mm -hmm. it it improved my shooting a lot uh, but it had started from a very low bar so <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, and co coach Sam also uh, Broke it down to uh, always step to receive, step to receive mm -hmm. the pass. Yeah. And uh, uh, another one is, uh, is a, a fake is a natural movement cut short. Yeah. Those things still. That's great. Still, I still remember them. And mm -hmm. Coach Caldwell, who you knew uh, for a long time as a player, uh, he taught me the essence of fear as a motivator. <laughs> <laughs> he, he he would get right up in our faces, you know, almost spitting on us when he was talking just by accident and said, I want you to get that damn guy. I don't want him coming down the baseline anymore. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> well, like like Greg Glora, our team said, Coach told him once in one of the championship 
tournament games that, uh, Greg, if you'd missed that shot, you'd been sitting over here with me. <laughs> As an assistant coach. <laughs> yeah, so those three coach, not that Coach Stolen wasn't a fine coach and even finer man, but he had these two fabulous assistants, yeah. uh, Sam and Tom Caldwell, who just uh, made him that much better. How did that affect you uh, as far as pursuing a journalism career? Did those things ever come to mind? You know, and I'm not talking about necessarily the basketball techniques, but you know, there's a certain way of writing, et cetera. And I would think that some of the things that Sam talked about as far as doing things the right way, uh, you'd, you'd almost have to say in, in journalism, that that would apply also. Is that true or not? It's true, Joe. He, uh, those three aphorisms of his that I just told you about that he used to describe in breaking the game down uh, taught me to do the same with my reporting, to look for short, sweet, succinct sentences that would reach the reader because of their simplicity. And not because they were simple-minded, but because they just made a lot of sense what somebody thought about them. And so I applied that to interviews with people. I keep my questions to a minimum and let the person I was interviewing uh, hog the conversation mm -hmm. because I didn't make any of my judgments till I got back to the typewriter or later the computer keyboard. I just smiled and nodded and wrote everything down <laughs> and then made my judgments when I got back. Uh, so Sam taught me that part. Uh, Coach Butel taught me never make an excuse. It was like just a, a, almost a prayer hanging over me. Uh, so I, if I messed up and I did from time to time in my journalism career, I blame nobody but myself. And finally, Tom Caldwell taught me that intensity is fine if it's channeled, if it's funneled into something productive, something meaningful. You can't just be pissed off and expect that to uh, be the way to success. You have to be intense, but with a, a purpose. I don't think I've heard anybody say it that way before. Boy, you nailed it there with, with Coach. He was he was so intense. But as I as I say in the book, and as we've talked about before, we loved the guy. You yeah. Know, we, we loved him because he made us better. And we knew yeah. we knew in his heart that's why he was pushing as hard as he was, because he wanted us to be the best we could be. And, uh, you know, I tried to use that in my coaching mm. techniques, too, but uh, he was excellent at that. He was also a, a terrific scout for other teams oh. whenever he had the chance to go to a game uh, with Washburn or Rockhurst or somewhere when we weren't playing. He, he was down there taking Boku notes and coming back with uh, to tell us they're weak here, they're strong here, they like to do this, we can't let them do that. And that really helped us uh, amass victories. Yeah. His preparation. Yeah, that's true. Now, this, this is kind of a sidebar conversation, and, and I don't, uh, we really don't have time to get into it extremely deeply, but I sense from uh, what you learned from them. 
and, and you applied some of the principles that, that they stood for as a journalist. And today it doesn't seem to me, and, and maybe I'm prejudiced at the way I look at this, but it just doesn't seem like you can trust a journalist like you used to be able to trust them. I mean, back when I was younger, you know, I'd listen to well, who was the guy who was on every night. He was the voice of America. Walter Cronkite. Cronkite. Cronkite, sorry. The most, the most yeah. trusted man in America. Yeah, and he really leaned left, is what I heard afterward, but you never, ever knew it. And then, no. you know, and today, I mean, as soon as somebody starts talking, you know which direction they're going, even though they're supposed to be a journalist and just reporting the information. So, yeah. that, now that's my opinion. Where do you fall in this? Because, I mean, you're the professional. I'm old school as hell, Joe. I think that you keep yourself out of the story. There's no reason for you to put yourself in the story in any way, shape, or fashion. You're the conduit for, for the information to flow from the people you have met and interviewed to your audience, the people who are reading the newspaper or the magazine. and to insert your own political or sociological views is just awful for the credibility that journalists need. If we lose credibility, and I think we have, mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't have anything. If people don't believe us, then we're screwed, glued, and tattooed. And I, I agree with you that Opinion is now passing itself off as facts. Yeah. And one of the most detrimental technological reasons for this uh, is social media. Uh, Twitter and other platforms let you put out your own thoughts about a story that you're working on. And the no way should that be happening. You do your story without regard to how's it going to play on Twitter. How do you think that came about? I mean, was it a gradual thing that happened, or was there some event that caused people to just say, "Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put my opinion as part of my reporting." Well, I think. It's been gradual, but it's been steady. It's been going on for 20 to 25 years. And it starts with younger reporters viewing themselves as social justice warriors. Mm. They think that old farts like me don't have the drive or the sentimentality to go after uh, what they perceive as evil or wrongdoing. I think that is the job of a journalist. It's an old saying, but to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> and we should have been, we, we should have stopped uh, when that started with the input of information. Uh, and I had a city editor in Topeka when I was on that paper, and he was classic right out of central casting. He had a white crew cut and was missing a couple of fingers that, he lost in the printing press somewhere. And one time I wrote a story about uh, the Reverend Holloway who was trying to ban alcohol in airplanes flying across Kansas. He wanted Kansas to be a dry state, but airplanes had to stop serving booze in his opinion. So I did a profile of him and 
went out the next morning, picked up the paper in the driveway, looked at it. There was my story with my byline. I went on down to work, and I was at my desk when I hear Pete Peterson, that's the city editor, yell, Tharp! And I thought, oh, shit. So I went over to his desk, and he said, you got a front-page story in the paper today, right? He said, you put a lot of time and work into it, didn't you? I said, yes, sir. And he said, yeah, you did. But you misspelled his name every freaking time you used it in the freaking story. Except he didn't say, say freaking. And, of course, this is right, right in the open bay of the newsroom where anybody and everybody could hear me getting <laughs> my ass chewed out. <laughs> uh, but it's uh, something I never forgot, obviously. I've tried, and I tried to apply that to the kids I taught, too. Uh, I scared the hell out of them the first couple of days of classes. And many of them wanted to leave and they talked to their parents and they told me this later that their parents said, no, no, give it a little while, give it a little while. And they wound up saying, you know, I was the best teacher they ever had or stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that, that seemed to work. And that came from Caldwell, followed by inspiration. Yeah. And he he groomed that us in us, mm -hmm. uh, me for two years and you for four. Mm -hmm. Before we take another break, I, I did want to ask you one last question in, in this Shoot. area. Um, and it goes back to the basketball side. Why did you keep playing competitively after you – got into a career and I mean you're, you're in the war zone, you're traveling all the time, etc. Why'd you keep playing ball? I was addicted to it <laughs> by this time. Uh in fact, at age thirty six, you let me play on your city league team in Topeka in nineteen eighty one. Uh, and all those guys were current or uh, recent college players. And uh, I didn't. I think I started one game because several people didn't show up. Uh, but it, it was so fun for me to play with guys who knew what they were doing. And uh, it was all a, a credit to you for letting me be on the team. That same kind of addiction. led me to try to play wherever I lived and worked. When I got transferred to Tokyo in 1976, one of the last questions I would ask people I was meeting the first time around was, uh, do you know any place to play basketball? Do you know any basketball team? And I didn't get too much luck until I finally found the first uh, – sports club in Japan that this former Air Force guy had opened up and he he was a muscle bound weightlifter but a good guy and he, he sponsored a team from that uh that from that sports center. And so I got on that team and we played a lot of Japanese teams and uh, various leagues uh, and I did that. I played every year for 11 years, including, I think, about four years with the Japanese team as well. Just like in baseball, the Japanese basketball teams were allowed to have two gaijin, two foreigners mm. on their team, just like baseball. Mm -hmm. And so my friend... Eddie Joe Davis, who played football at SMU but loved basketball, he found the, the Skylarks, that was the name of the team. And uh, I, I got on there, too. And uh, I learned so much about the Japanese from that experience uh, 
what what really counted for them, what mattered to them. It was, as you know, a, a unique way to penetrate a culture is to see how they act and react in uh, a game. And I certainly learned a lot that way. Plus, it was fun to go to different gyms and stuff. We had two brothers, both of them 6'5", who were multi-millionaires because their dad had started a company after the occupation. And it was doing really well, and they were involved with it. And we would uh, get in their Rolls Royces and <laughs> roll up to the, these uh, Cracker Box gyms where we played the, the Japanese. It was pretty funny. Well, that, that's cool. Um, Mike, I think we're going to take another short break. All right. Um, when we come back, I'd like to uh, visit a little bit more about your playing ball in, in other countries. And, and uh, I'm going to talk about your time in Vietnam, too. Okay. I know because that has had a tremendous effect on you. Uh, not only in your career, etc., but on your health. So I'd, I'd kind of like to talk about that when we come back. Okay? Very good. Uh, thanks, Mike. 